I'm Lisa Zainab Killinger. I'm a doctor of chiropractic from Davenport, Iowa. And um, I embraced Islam in 1979 uh, while I was a student at Iowa State University, like many of you are students here. And uh, don't hold it against me that I was from Iowa State. I actually have a daughter here, so it's a moral dilemma for me knowing who to root for when there's a football game. And I have another daughter going to come to Iowa, come to Iowa next year, inshallah. So um, I found um, Islam a very, very interesting religion and have, um, as our previous speaker uh, was talking about, I found it important to question, as Islam does actually encourage us to question our deen. And I found it to be a faith very, very just and very fair, particularly with the rights of women and the rights of the oppressed and those things. And so I do lecture on women's issues in Islam. Some of you I've seen before as familiar faces in the crowd in previous um, Iowa Muslim conferences. And um, also another interest of mine is peace in Islam. So I do do some lecturing on peace um, and universal peace through Islam, which really catches uh, people off guard when they're non-Muslim because they don't look at Islam as the religion of peace. But we know as Muslims that that uh, is a fair description. But my topic at hand today, which was given to me, and I thought, oh, don't give me this topic, but they gave it to me and I'm going to do my best, is finding a soulmate Islamically. And this is a topic ripe with um, opportunities for discussion. So I'm going to be very brief and hopefully we, you, we can have some question and answer, some commu communication here in the room. I'm not planning to make any love connections or anything while we're here in the room, but uh, we'll do what we can. One question I think we have to pose, and I think some of you have handouts and some of you are sharing them. Um, my apologies, I've made as many as I could. Are you ready to find a soulmate? And not everybody is really ready to, for marriage in Islam. It's a big commitment. It's a big commitment in effort and in time. Um, but many um, know that marriage is considered half of our deen. If we add up all the credits that we get for prayer and fasting and giving and charity and many of our faith acts, a good marriage or success in marriage is equivalent to that. So that's a pretty hefty amount of blessings and a pretty hefty amount of responsibilities to do something to get that much credit that's equivalent to prayer and fasting and everything else we do. Because sometimes we feel burdened that that's a lot that we have to do as Muslims to pray so many times and to fast and all the, all the efforts we make. But think of marriage as being equivalent to all of that put together over your whole life, that's equivalent to marriage. So it's a tough go. It takes work. And then I think if people are interested in this topic, they have to be doing some introspection. Are you ready now in your time or in your um, life to be married in Islam? Are you, you know, if you're a woman, do you want to live with a boy? You have to think about it. I mean, it's completely different and sometimes a lot less fun than living with your girlfriends, right? Or li living with your sisters. If you're a man, are you ready to live with a woman all the time? It's a, you know, it's a decision you have to make. Are you ready to commit to that in Islam, to be a wife or a husband? So that's one thing we have to reflect about as we're talking about this topic. Are you ready? If you're going to find a soulmate, are you first ready for marriage in Islam? And you have to think of um, choosing a partner in Islam to, to marry as is this somebody, you, are, you choose, are you ready to choose someone that you're willing to grow old with? Are you willing to take someone and then to travel forward through the rest of your life with them and grow old with them? And thinking of the person that you're choosing as your soulmate, as an old man or an old woman with you, as your life's partner, you have to think that through because this is a forever deal. That's our goal, right, in, in marriage in Islam. We want to marry forever. Sometimes it doesn't happen that way or work out that way, but that's our goal. So think about, are you ready to grow old with someone, one person, for the rest of your life? Of course, so many blessings um, in marriage, but think about the concept of marriage in general first, before we talk about finding that soulmate. Marriage is bringing together not only two human beings, but it's bringing together two different genders. If you're a male, and you've had mostly interactions with males in your life, suddenly you're going to be interacting about everything with a female. If you're a female, suddenly the person you get to collaborate with about everything is a male. It's bringing together two genders, not an easy task. It's bringing up two upbringings. It's bringing together two people from different upbringings. So do you think, sir, that you were raised differently than this nice sister over here with the mellow yellow? Do you think you were probably raised a little bit differently in your household? What are the odds that she'd be raised identically to you? 
in the way that you were scolded, in the way that you were reprimanded, in the way that you were encouraged, in the way your parents dealt with you and interacted with you, in your goals, in your dreams. We're bringing together two completely different upbringings, a different set of values and a different set of things that we're accustomed to in our family. Maybe we ate completely differently, and I didn't mean to pick on you, sir or ma'am. Um, maybe we ate completely differently. Maybe our schedule at our house was that we ate dinner every night at 6, and that was dinner time, and that's when we ate. But you end up married to somebody that re they're ready for dinner at 10 o'clock at night. How cosmopolitan of them. But if you're that 6 o'clock eater, trust me, there's uh, a little bit of issue. And certainly you're going to have to get together and find something to cooperate on. So it's tough. Two different upbringings as well. Two different families and their respective cultures. Whenever I see a sister and a brother from two completely different cultures, maybe, for example, um, my daughter raised with a, an American parent, and then maybe a brother who was raised by two parents from the same culture. Maybe they were Indo-Pakistani. I think about, boy, if you choose two different cultures for your marriage, you have a lot to overcome. You have to get used to that culture. You have to learn about it. You have to find what you respect about it. You have to find what you are willing to embrace and bring into your own thing. Islam isn't our only culture, as Dr. Lang was talking about earlier. We bring in other things into our cultures, and that definitely plays into the success of a marriage. So you have some stumbling blocks and challenges if you come from two different cultures, definitely. How about habits? When you marry, you marry that person's habits. Trust me. It is no, sm I mean, there's, the American television is ripe with with commentary about leaving the lid up and leading, leaving the lid down, about, you know, putting the toilet paper roll on after they go the, if they use up the last of the toilet. All of those issues that are the everyday habits about belching, about the way that you wash your hands, about the way that you take everything, suddenly you're going to have to live in the same house with and get along with the way that person is. So everybody's habits are going to have to meld. Again, no small uh, challenge, this marriage in Islam. And also you're bringing together two bodies. You have to be somewhat compatibly, um, compatible physically, spiritually, and you're going to end up being soulmates for the rest of your life. So again, just to, to raise the bar here and have, have you understand what's on the line here. It's a big deal. That's why we get so many credits for and so many blessings for doing marriage right. Um, I brought the quote of Quran here that we've created you in pairs so that you can remember the grace of Allah and the great bounty of God. The wonderful blessings of God are recognized through marriage and certainly, even though it's a great challenge, so many blessings in marriage. Um, I would like you to read a little bit into this verse, verse. We created you in pairs, and the duality of creation is referred to in Quran over and over and over again. We're not created as single entities. We're not created as lone human beings that are supposed to go through our life isolated from society or isolated from other genders or isolated from our brothers and sisters. We are to be pairs. That's how we were created in pairs. So very, very important in Islam that we talk about bringing together a pair that's going to work. And I know there's one seat up here. If somebody wants to take a chair so you don't have to stand, you're welcome to come on up. And you can commandeer these other chairs we're not using as well. So what is Islam? You think you're ready? Who in this room thinks you're ready? I mean, some of you guys may be in the market, right? Some of you ladies and, and men, sisters and brothers are ready. You're in the market. You're going to be choosing a soulmate. How many does that apply to, that you have not found your soulmate, but you're going to be in the market in the next five years? What do you think? How many of you? Because I want to know who I'm talk speaking to here. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, look at half the room. Almost half the room. You're ready. You think you're ready. You're going to be choosing a soulmate. So what does Islam have to say about choosing? First and foremost, it says, Choose the partner that's the most pious. Choose the partner that's the most pious. But what does that mean? Does that mean that this is the person who spends all day in prostration? They pray all the time. But then outside of prayer, they're really mean to everyone. No, this is not piety. Piety is an extrapolation of how we deal with and communicate with and treat other human beings, right? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was constantly friendly, caring, loving, trustworthy in his dealings. He extrapolated piety, which maybe some of you think of as being regular in your prayers, into his life. And that's the example from which you should choose. You should find that brother or sister 
who treats their parents with kindness, no matter how big, how much they differ with them. And certainly as a um, person that came from non-Islamic roots, I have parents that don't choose the same lifestyle I choose. But I have to treat them respectfully. Even when I see them doing differently than I would do. I can't scold them. I can't reprimand them. I can try to live a good example of my life and hope that they see some good in it. That's the best we can hope for. So how many of you have ever met a person and you thought they were great and then you saw them communicating with their mother, let's say if it was a man, communicating with his mother and he was just disrespectful. Sharp with his mother, short with her, maybe demanding of her, maybe a little bit disrespectful. Boy, women, if I were you and I was choosing a mate, I'd steer way clear of that man who can't even find it in his heart of hearts to be kind to the one human being on this earth that we are requested to treat with respect, and that's our mother. That's a biggie in Islam. That's a big indication of piety right there. And it's also a big indication of their inner relationship with other human beings. Even though we may be males and females, we're all of the human species. We are humans. And the way we treat other human beings, particularly our mothers, says a lot. And maybe, brothers, you've seen some sister who, you th they're, they're always in the mosque. They're always at prayer. They're always doing things in the community. But boy, when you see them talk to their mother or father, not good at all. So you have to look at that, that how do they treat their parents? Because that's a really good indicator of how they will treat their spouse in a marital situation. Very important. I think that's, that's what I would hold as important. If I were going to marry somebody, I would want somebody who would treat me kindly and respectfully, even when I get old. And eventually, we're all going to get there, right? We're all aging, inshallah. What about um, a person who is patient? I've put my list of some of my most valued things here. A person who is patient and a person who is kind. Sabr, patience is one of the highest attributes in Islam. And if you're bisabr, if you're without patience, piety is far behind. This is lagging. This is showing that maybe you've mastered the rituals of Islam. You know how to pray. You know what the rules are. But if you haven't extrapolated them in patience with other human beings, trust me, the marriage will be a challenge. Because if that person is bisabr, or without patience, in the way that they deal with you as a wife, or you, as a husband, is going to be a rough go, isn't it? And how many of you think, and this is married and non-married people, how many of you think that sometimes there are situations in marriage that are extremely stressful? How many think? And I'm not going to take abstentions from voting. How many think there's no stress in marriage? OK, then some of you non-voters, next time we vote, you're going to have to get on the stick, because that, that was, there was too many no-shows there. But definitely, the majority of the room felt that, yeah, there's some stressful circumstances. And if you um, are with somebody who has no patience or who has a bad temper, it's going to get rough. It's going to be a tough go of it. So also, steadfastness in prayer is a good indicator of piety and that they're humble. All right, you think you get it. You got it. You know what we're supposed to be, what the target is. The target is, you know it's going to be a lot of work, but you're ready for a soulmate, and you know you've got to be looking towards piety, so now how do we get there? What are the tools we have at our fingertips, and how do we go about it? Is there anyone in the room here whose parents basically chose a spouse for them? It's all right. It's not so something to be ashamed of. It's uh, a wonderful thing. So you can see that there's a person or one or two people in this room that a, the parents made the decision or basically guided them towards somebody, and then they made the decision themselves. The rest of you, I'm assuming, you're going to have to do this on your own, or you did it on your own. You found a, sp a spouse, or you're going to find a spouse, inshallah, on your own. So I think, and I think in Islam it's fair to say that niyat is a big part of what, if we want to do something, and we've decided we want to do something, we have to say our niyat is to do that, right? If you're going to go to prayers, you say, I intend to praise or prayer, or I intend to pray asr prayer. If you're wanting to um, get married, it's my niyat to find a good spouse, right? So intention. Has anybody ever seen Dr. Wayne or read any of his books? It's a real popular show in California and around. Um, one of those people like Dr. Phil, only his big thing is intention. And you'd think he'd been reading the Quran, where everything is intention. We have to intend. So say that niyat. I think first step, if you're going to look for a spouse and you think you're ready, is give that niyat or that intention. 
And then also pray. And should we pray for a spouse that's very beautiful or a spouse that's very this? Maybe, maybe we should just have some humility and pray for what's khair, what's best for us in this life and in the next. Because maybe we feel we're ready. Allah, Allah, Allah knows better for us. And maybe we should get married five or six down, years down the line when we're a little bit more mature. Allah knows. So we pray for what's khair. Ask Allah, if it's khair for me, then help me to find a good spouse. That's a really good strategy. You, you can sometimes, you know, undermine yourself by praying for something that, that may not be good for you. But if you pray for what's khair, you, you can never lose, right? So pray for what's best for you in this life and the next. And then it doesn't hurt to be practical and put the word out. The word on the streets that you want to find a spouse and suddenly, trust me, there will be offers made. Some of them, not ones that you want to entertain, but there will be offers made. I embraced Islam in 1979. I certainly had no intention of marrying for a long time, but sisters feel like the best gift they could give me would be a spouse, usually their brother or cousin or uncle or somebody. And they're, sister, I have the perfect man for you. He's a little older than you. I know you're only 18 or 19, you know, but he's 35, you know, losing a little hair, but you know, he's a good man, a pious man. And I'm thinking, what in the heck? I mean, like just barely, I'm still a teenager and they're trying to bring me these really old men. And I, you know, I was mortified. And first of all, I felt like a cow being led to slaughter. I was really horrified. But see, it was their great purity of their hearts that they were in wanting something good for me. And it was very touching and moving for me that they would offer up as the greatest gift they could give me a potential spouse. I thought it was very sweet, but it was also very frightening. And I'm, you know, I'm sure my daughter's in the back of the room going, oh man, I hope she never does that to me. But uh, Muslims are funny. <laughs> but put out the word on the streets to people that you really like. Don't let just everybody know. Let the people know that you really trust and that you really know. They know you. They know what you're like and they know what you like and what you might like in a spouse. And it doesn't hurt to tell them some of the attributes that you're looking for. If you're a sister that doesn't choose to wear hijab, then you would have to say. I mean, I think there's really a false advertising is a bad thing. You shouldn't say, you know, I'm a very pious sister, but I don't, you know, and I wear hijab all the time. If you're not going to wear hijab in the marriage, you should be, you know, at least frank enough to say, I don't wear hijab most of the time, but maybe with encouragement, inshallah, down the line I would. Or I do wear hijab and I, I want a husband who would be supportive of that. Or I want a husband who would be willing to pray with me five times a day, including fajr. That tough one. Remember, Dr. Lang said, you know, when we say there's five prayers a day and that one of them is before sunup, that eliminates some of the crowd from wanting to come to the mosque. Well, in my case, I wanted to find a husband who was very pious. I wanted to find a husband who prayed five times a day and who would be my imam in prayer five times a day. But after we got married, sadly, when I tried to wake him for prayer, he would yell at me. It was very sad. It was sad for me as a new Muslim. It was very sad for me. So needless to say, I'm not in my first marriage. But in, in fact, when I, went to do, when I was asked to do this talk, I said, you want to have the divorced woman who's remarried now talk about this? I mean, I don't know if my track record's that good. But they said, no, no, you can learn best from the ones who've made the mistakes. And trust me, if there is a mistake, oh yeah, I've made it, surely. So hopefully you can learn and not do the same things. You know? And so I looked for piety in the, in the fact that somebody prayed five times a day or said that they prayed five times a day and I never saw them in action. And I never heard from other people that had lived with that person. And what I found out, I had sort of like false advertising and I married a husband who never prayed. Never prayed except for in public. You know that verse, Surah Ma'un, where those people who pray to be seen praying but when they're asked to give neighborly deeds, they have a very tiny heart. Unfortunately, I married into that, and it was a very hard thing for a new sister, very tough. So I was very isolated in my first uh, eight years as a Muslim, you know, after I married. It was very, very tough. But alhamdulillah, you know, I kept my deen and said that this is more important to me than anything. And if he wants to go astray, perhaps he'll have to go there himself. So... Inshallah, you'll find out how deep piety really is in this brother or sister that you choose as a spouse before you commit. And then I put down here on the slide, we're now on the second page here, that you could ask your parents to help. And I know I put question marks after it because there are some parents who you are this far apart with, right? They have nothing in common with you, you have nothing in common with them, and the people that they might choose 
have nothing to do with what you would want. Sometimes it works well. Sometimes it wouldn't work well. But you know your parents, and you, you know your relationship with them, and you know the wisdom they, they, they possess, or you know, think you know the wisdom they don't possess. So if you feel your parents are wise and might help you in at least identifying some potential people that might be good um, spouses, then ask your parents to help. Maybe they have friends that have a son or a daughter that might be very similar to you in your piety and nature, and you might end up having a very happy match from using your parents as a resource. Here I am. I am the mother of four children. Yasmin, Nisreen, Milad, and Nazneen. My oldest, as I told you, is 20 in college, and, and my youngest now is uh, 13. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, I love my children. My oldest one was raised in this country. She was raised by primarily an American mother. As I told you, her father and I divorced, and he's out of the picture for the rest of her life. We have not had contact with him. Very, very sad circumstance for her. Um, so when she wants to get married, and recently she decided that maybe she's, you know, kind of considering that in a few years she'll be ready. She's, you know, now at least doesn't hate boys, and so, you know, she thinks that maybe there might be a time when it's possible. I never saw it coming, because she was pretty like this with males for a long time. Not having a good, you know, example of a man at home, she was pretty standoffish about marriage. Last year, she asked me, of all people, to find her a husband. Again, shocked. I'm like, you know my track record. You're asking me to find you a, a spouse? She's like, you know me better than anyone. I'm sure that you could find people who you know would have value the same things as me, who would be really, really value Islam first in their life and would be a good partner for me. Again, I'm mortified. No pressure on me whatsoever, right? But I'm supposed to find her a spouse. I have not been successful so far, but we're working on it. Then I wrote as the next slide here, and I'm sorry I didn't bring it to project here. I was told I wouldn't have PowerPoint, but so I just brought you handouts. The next thing would be to go shopping. And this is your choice. If you want to shop Islamically, you can. But I certainly discourage the shopping for a spouse in the context of American culture. Dating, of course, not, not okay. But shopping, find out what's out there. And I don't think that there's any harm to going to, going to one of these many websites that I wrote here for you, shadi.com, the most successful track record on a, on a um, site, half a million you know, opportunities there, about a half a million, sorry, one and a half million opportunities, half a million pictures of photos so that you can go that next step to see if somebody you feel is physically um, compatible, and then 50,000 success stories. This is a, an amazing resource. If I were in the market, I would scan a little bit to see what kinds of people are out there, at least on paper. And then maybe hone it down and just see. I may not ever communicate with any of them on behalf of my daughter, but I want to know the type of people that are out there, what values are being expressed as far as that. If I get somebody, to trust me, on a website that says, wanted, doctor of Indo-Pakistani descent for my very you know, beautiful daughter, whatever, I'm going to say, you know what, their values just aren't in the right place. I really don't want to marry into this family. If that's the thing that they're valuing is a, is a title, you know, that's understandable. And for that family, that might be the perfect thing. But I'm sure that wouldn't be my daughter's value, what the person's title is. She would want a person who really, who would not miss their prayers for anything. So that would be their, the value that we're looking for. And that's going to be hard to find, I'm sure, Michelle. And this uh, environment, just like Dr. Lang was talking about, what percent of the students here in the room are at the mosque regularly? You know, half a percent of what's in society? It's, it's sad. So somebody that can be a partner. You have to shop a little bit and see what's out there. Kiran.com, another good source, Islamicmatches.com. Zawaj.com is known for being easy to use and maneuver around in the website and get to, um, to hone down your search. And uh, Muslim Matrimonials um, Network.com. These are just a fragment of dozens of sites like this for Muslims to go shop Islamically, not putting, th putting anything out there on the line, not degrading yourself, but to just ask, you know, what are your values and if they match with, with uh, the values of someone you're trying to find. But warning, again, I'm going to put in that warning because I married somebody that I didn't know very well. If um, what some people put on paper about themselves 
isn't always a representative sample of what they actually are like. Some people perceive themselves as the most pious brothers in the world or the most pious sisters in the world. But when push comes to shove, maybe they're not quite so, you know, Islamic. So it's good. It's very good. And Islam was the first religion to encourage women to take their own choice into their own hands and make the decision on their own that didn't allow a parent or a male relative to say, you know what, this is who you're going to marry, or didn't allow the bartering and trading and buying and selling of women. So that example that was used earlier where John Belushi was trying to tease as a pretend he was a Muslim and said, how much for the women? That's so inaccurate. We know it. But the American public doesn't know it. We can't, in Islam, barter, trade, or give women away, or arrange marriages without the woman's consent. Alhamdulillah, women's rights. We have the right to choose who we want. Part of that choice is getting to know someone. I would never encourage somebody that met and wrote to each other to seal the deal without meeting and without seeing each other in their family environments. Again, for that issue I was referring to earlier, how does this person treat their mother? How do they interact with their sisters? How do they interact with their brothers, the younger, the older? All those things are really big windows into a person's treatment of you as a spouse. Definitely a huge issue and a great opportunity for you because you haven't gambled anything in Islam. You haven't um, compromised your moral values if you've spent time with another Muslim's family, right? You haven't spent time alone with them. You haven't become physically involved with them. You haven't done all of those things. You've just spent time with another human being's family to learn more about how they engage and how they interact. And that's incredibly important. And I encourage you to do that as the next step. Find out and meet the family. You know that movie, Meet the Parents. They weren't kidding, it's important. And I always say this to my oldest daughter, that even if you meet the family, and even if you've read about them, and even if they've written to you, and you found out what, they, what their values allegedly are on paper, I would personally not marry someone unless I got into a stress stressful situation with them and found out how they react. Because you know what? Some people can put their best foot forward in many circumstances, but when there's a stressful situation, you find out that they have a terrible temper or that they treat people really bad around them. The person whose flight is late. This is, these are the people you have to watch. In the airport line, Watch how the people, one after the other, treat that per poor person at the other end of the desk, who is not their fault that the flight was late. And trust me, the, worst, the last thing they want is for that flight to be delayed or late, right? They want nothing more than to have things go smoothly. But you'll see, some people take it out on those people behind the counter. This would be not the person to get in a marriage with, because that's going to extrapolate into home life. Trust me, it will. If they cannot be respectful to other human beings in stressful circumstances, Chances are, under a marriage circumstance, that will also extrapolate into your life. And nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. Somebody wants somebody whose deen is so much embedded in their life that they can control their temper. And the big thing that Muslims are supposed to control, the tongue, right? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that if somebody has a bad temper, they're not one of us. They're not a believer. It's, it's not comprehensible that someone who has Islam as a deen can also have a bad temper, an ill temper, and treat other people badly because of it. It's not a possibility to be pious and to have that. They don't go together. It's like oil and vinegar. They just, they don't mix. When you shake them up, they try to mix, but they always come apart, don't they, in the end? So look for temper and look for that in stressful circumstances. You can do that Islamically still by spending time with the family, maybe traveling with the family or traveling with other people that are your age. You know, nothing like traveling to, to put a stressful environment, or nothing like uh, maybe watching somebody else's kids to uh, put you in a stressful environment, or to build a project or do a project together. And I wrote here, arrange an activity together. Let's see you arrange a dinner party for someone, right? You're thinking of marrying somebody, you say, let's have some friends over. You arrange a dinner party together and you collaborate about it. Boy, oh boy, you will learn more in those three hours of preparing that meal and getting the guests there and arranging that than you will learn from writing to someone for 3,000 years, I am telling you, absolutely. That sort of thing, arranging an event or doing something together where you have to collaborate will give you so much more information and will protect you. And I'm, and I'm gonna say I'm a little bit gender biased here because I'm a sister and I know sisters, you have a lot on the line. Brothers, you have a lot on the line as well, but sisters, you know, the potential for maltreatment is very real 
and very, very hard to contend with. Pray always that your family is a good support network with them and that you stay close. Don't isolate yourself from your other sisters and from your family because that, that support network is important in a society like this that doesn't have a large family unit that's very close, that's a check and balance for people's behavior within a marriage. Here, you get married and you move to an apartment, don't you? You go off on your own and nobody ever sees what goes on behind closed doors. The family rarely visits, you're not together too much, and suddenly there's opportunity for a lot of things to go bad and for nobody to come to your assistance in need. In need. So certainly in this society, keep your support network, excuse me, support network around you. And I relate the one hadith that the best among you is the one who is kindest to their wife from um, Bukhari Sharif. So what to not to do when searching for a spouse? We'll have to put some of these on the line and then I'll end very shortly so we can um, discuss. Don't get physical. I know that I can write it, I can say it, but boy oh boy I've seen it literally dozens and dozens of times, good brothers and good sisters, that they talk to someone on the internet and they start getting interested about marriage and then talk runs a little bit uh, like, oh, I can't wait to hold you in my arms, and then talk gets a little bit more sexual, and then their relationship, when they, once they come together, they couldn't wait to get into each other's arms, and then physical things, suddenly, you know what, all the other things and all the other criterion that they were supposed to be assessing about that person are totally erased because of the physical attraction. You know the hadith, that half of a man's wisdom is lost between the legs of a woman. It's a very common hadith. It's repeated and, and it's a uh, hadith qudsi. It's a good hadith. Because when desires are in the way, suddenly all the other criterion don't seem very significant to you. Need is so much to be a pair in Islam that when people get together and are alone together, yeah, shaitan is the third party. So boy, avoid that physical. If you can keep it out of physical, even to the, in the context of kissing, you'll, give, you'll assure yourself that your wits are going to be about you to make a better decision about what are the other things that are important in the marriage. Because yes, yeah, sure, physical things are going to be wonderful once you're married, but once you talk about that and that's on the table, whoo, everything else, insignificant. So keep that one on the back burner if you, if you at all possibly can. So that's one of the don'ts. What's the other don't? Don't base your decision on, on the basis of looks. I've seen so many brothers who said, you know, I have the most, uh, you know, I'm looking for the most beautiful wife, or I'm looking for a wife who's very beautiful because I want them to be compatible with me. First of all, this person feels like they're in love with themselves, you know, Allah's gift to humankind. But uh, if, if they're interested in looks, those go away, don't they? Trust me, five years after a child, most women have kind of lost the shapely you know, figure and uh, wrinkles start and the whole thing de degrades downhill. And if, if a brother's goal is really to have somebody who's that beautiful and that's what their value is, you might be traded in for a newer model down the line. So best to avoid this. And don't forget you're going to be growing old together. I say it, but I know when you're 25 or when you're 18 or when you're 17 or when you're 13, it's very hard to envision that the person that you're going to choose for your spouse is a person that you're going to be 83 next to. So you better like that person a whole lot because there's not a lot of endearing qualities about an 83-year-old except for how they interact with other human beings. So it better be a decent human being that you're getting involved with. So what to do? I don't want to leave it all negatives. What to do? Talk about the big stuff. If you are interested in somebody about marriage, talk about children. Do they want them? When do they want them? What happens if, they were, if you were pregnant now and nine months from now you were going to have a child? How would they feel about that? What would they do? What would your lives be like? Talk those tough things out. You'll learn a lot about a person by talking out some of those tough things. Um, try negotiating. Let's say you live in University of Iowa, in Iowa City here. They live in California. You've been communicating. And you bring up the topic, where do you want to live? If it's not a negotiable point, if there's no discussion, well, of course, we're going to live here. This is where I live, blah, 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 blah. Is there ever going to be negotiation in your life about anything? That's the question to ask. Is this going to be a person who will negotiate, who will weigh things out, who will be able to talk about what's the pluses and minuses, and then will be able to come to a decision with you collaboratively? If that's not the case, it's not going to be a lot of fun for the husband or for the wife. Truly, even though a husband might say that he wants to have his way, 
he doesn't want a wife that always rolls over and he doesn't have any, you know, negotiation and collaboration. It's a very empty and shallow thing. And oftentimes they'll end up um, finding uh, some emotional comfort with other people because they don't have that negotiation at home. So negotiate, practice it. It's a good skill to have. So are you really, really ready? Are you really, really ready to find that soulmate? I had a very um, wise old woman tell me one time that she advised her daughter because she was looking at a spouse. She was, she was engaged. She was looking at a spouse, and the mom had a very bad feeling about this man. She, he was flashy. He was funny. He was fun to be around. He was many, many things, maybe even pious, but she had a bad feeling about it. And she told her daughter, can you envision this man if you became today paralyzed from the waist down and you became incontinent, meaning you couldn't control your bowels or your bladder, could th would this man be so dedicated to you that they would change your diaper? And would you want them to? Is this how much dedicated you are to each other? They rethought and they realized that they were really in it for now, but for the long range, they couldn't see that if everything went right, they would probably get along great. But if anything went wrong, this probably wouldn't have worked out. Think about it. You may end up in a circumstance that you couldn't have never fathomed. Hospitalization, terminal illness, um, having to clean up after each other in ways that you never ever imagined. Can you do that with the person you're thinking about? Is this the type of person who would be that humble to do that with you and for you? It's a toughie. It's a toughie. There's not that many people who can. So we'll go back. Half of your dean is your marriage and your choice of this soulmate. Remember, a lifetime of prayers and fasting doesn't equal the gifts that you will be having in marriage. But when you do marriage right, and I've done marriage wrong, and I've done marriage right, and it took me more than one try to get there. But alhamdulillah, when you have a spouse, that is your soulmate, you do have someone that you can laugh with, that you can go places with. You don't have to go alone and always think about, oh, who's going to be there? You've got your spouse. You've got someone who you can talk to when you're, when you're sad or when you're worried or you're scared and you can talk to and communicate with. You have somebody supporting you. And when something goes right in your life, you have somebody who's cheering for you. There's nothing like having something good happening in, in your life and having your spouse say, I am so proud of you. That's wonderful. And that's what marriage is when it's marriage that's right. It's a wonderful thing. Encouraging each other. Cheering each other on. Being the best advocate for that person. In Islam, in the Hadith, they talk about how a wife, a great attribute of a wife or a husband, is the one who covers the faults of their spouse. So do you love this person to the point where when they lose their good looks, you'll cover that fault and you'll say, you know what? You don't even know how nice they are and what a good person this is I'm married to. Or that they make mistakes. Maybe they stumble and fall at home a lot. Maybe they're totally clumsy. But you don't go around saying to your friends, oh, I can't believe that spouse of mine. They're so totally inept. They're always falling up. Well, you know, a simple example. You cover the faults of the ones you love. Your, your mother, your sisters, your brothers, and your spouse. So find somebody who will cover your faults and who you can wear. Like in the Quran, they say you're spouse will be a garment for you and you for them. It will cover your flaws, it will keep you warm when you're cold, and it will, you know, cover up those imperfections definitely and give you comfort. Definitely give you comfort and sukun. The um, quality of being comfort and having tranquility is part of Islamic marriage. And trust me, when you do it right, it's worth, it's worth getting there. And one of the other nice things is you might get to have wonderful babies together with them. And that's a great thing. There's nothing more wonderful than having children with someone that you love and raising them together. Um, I've been lucky, alhamdulillah, four times in that regard. So the ultimate question, it's the last, second to last slide there is, when you're choosing a soulmate, will this be someone who will help me grow closer to Allah? Is this someone who will help enhance my spirituality? Is this someone who will bring me to my deen every day of my life? And who will keep me from wrong? And if you can answer all of those things, yes, this is someone who will keep me close to Allah and bring me closer to my deen, then for goodness sakes, marry that man or marry that woman and uh, do the right thing Islamically. 
Jazakum Allah khair. And let's uh, read Surah Al-Asr, Wal-Asr together. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Wal-Asr. Inna l-insana la fi khusr. Illa ladina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawassaw bil haq. Iwa tawassaw bil sabr. Allah, please let us not be those people who are in a state of loss. Let us be those ones who have faith and do righteous deeds and teach each other of truth and patience, as Surah Al-Asr says. Very, very important uh, surah to remember. So now I think my time is still a little bit, and so if there's any questions or comments or discussion that you would like to have, don't be shy. Even though shyness is a great attribute in Islam, this is not the place for it at all. So you're going out, you're going out to find your spouses tomorrow, right? Inshallah. I see some people, they're ready, they're ready to go out of the door and find them. Anyone who has any questions, the gloves come off here. Anything is fair game from my own personal experience or from your personal experience. Yes, sister. Um, doesn't the, the hadith of the Prophet say that when, you, when like a person goes to get married, they have to have, like a, a guy comes for a girl, they have to have the brother, the, the father, the uncles, the grandfather. Mm -hmm. So all the men who are closely related to the woman, and if she goes for the guy, they have to have sisters. Don't you have to like have your family involved in it too? Not to go just one way, because some people do that. Yeah, some people do. They go on their own. And I think that we, um, we kind of jip ourselves out of a good opportunity, don't we? Would we leave our family out of it? Because there's a lot of wisdom to be gained in having your family there with you to help you in that decision. And not only to protect you from shaitan, because we can't be alone with another person of a different gender. And I know, I'm saying something that sounds stupid. You guys have been in school here in this country. You've been sitting at desks next to sisters and brothers and non-Muslim women and men your whole life. You've been in situations where you're on the bus with people smashed up against you that were not the same gender as you. But in Islam, when you're looking, it's really good to have not that time alone and to have your family there. It's very important and that's a, a good point. But the, that's the letter of it. But what's the spirit of it? I think Dr. Lang earlier was trying to make the point. What's the spirit of this? What's the point of this hadith? What do you, what do you get out of this? this? Family is important and don't spend time alone together. Two things, simple. And so however you need to do that, by sp maybe it's having dinner with your family, together or maybe it's going out when you, if you want to go shopping in the mall and see how they are shopping because that's a definitely a testimony to a man's resiliency is how well they survive the mall um, would be having somebody else in your family with you because they're going to notice things that you don't know maybe you're just head over heels in love with this person you know you're trying to restrain yourself but you're totally you know infatuated with them and you think oh yeah this is mr right they're going to notice things that you have your mind is totally befogged and you won't notice so it's good it's good to have those impartial people that love you and are concerned for your well-being it's a it's a good point sister and it is true i wonder if you could make some just some comments about uh, the role of education marriage and how they're compatible or prioritize them um education in that should your spouse be educated uh, or past high school education Mm -hmm. students who try to get married in these kind of situations. Oh boy, yeah. I always feel for students who marry um, young and are in college together, but also too, I've seen so many great, great relationships that were young people that married and grew together. Um, I think the important thing is if, you're, if val education is a value of yours, and it's an Islamic value, right? What's the first word in the Quran? Ikra, read. You know, it's a value. It's not only our right, but it's our responsibility for all, especially women, to become educated because we're the first school of our children, right? So if your value is education, that you hold it highly, of course you would want to marry somebody that has that same value of education and that, or that it would be very respectful and uh, supportive of you gaining that education. Some people choose to wait till they're out of school. But if the choice is to go astray and have desires and to maybe start you know, interacting un-Islamically with another woman because you're waiting to get out of school, then maybe you should get married earlier and learn, you know, and grow together. But there is something to be said for maturity. And I think a lot of people think they're ready for marriage because they have desires, but the rest of their development hasn't really caught up and the rest of their maturity hasn't really caught up and they have a lot of growing yet to do. So what does Islam say about if you feel desires and uh, you're worried about sinning, what should you do? Fast, absolutely. It's, you know, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that if you're hungry, your body isn't thinking about sex, 
period. It's surviving. You know, it needs food. And so it keeps your mind totally off of, of these other more base desires because food is an absolute essential. And drink, water is absolutely essential. So do fast. And I know people, ah, fasting, that's old fashioned, whatever. Trust me, it works. In Ramadan, yeah, you have a lot less, uh, you know, desire to go astray than in other times of the month because you're focused on what? When you break your fast, that's what you're focused on, that breaking of fast. And that's, that's you know, that does protect you a lot from shaitan. It certainly does. And you all, you all knew it. I didn't have to speak to you. Yes? I would just like to add uh, istihara, salat or istihara. It helps a lot with every major decision, especially with marriage. Absolutely. Uh, experiences, uh, and uh, alhamdulillah, I didn't make the wrong choice. Okay. Thanks to istihara, yeah. Yeah, and that is the praying the rakats of istikhara, asking God for guidance in a particular topic, never a bad thing. And I think that was what I was alluding to, but not specifically on my first slides, is first make the intention, ask Allah for what is khair, and do that in the form of istikhara, because we have guidance that tells us what to do. And that's a very good point, brother. Thank you for bringing it up. Yes, sir. I would like to make a comment about the verse in the Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and among his signs that he created for you from among yourselves, spouses. And then he made it very clear that there are three stages in this life of marriage. And then he made a conclusion after that for those who have mind to reflect, to sign. What are those three stages? Number one, and that means to dwell with her in peace and as you know, when teenagers get together, the first thing they want is to have second. They have to come down and to get all their desire out. And so that's the first period. The next period comes mawadda. After they live with each other, they start indeed love each other. And they start having passion for each other. And then after that, the third stage will be warahma, mercy. When some of them get ill or sick, the others stand by her or she stands by him. And in that, wa fi dalik, in dalik, ayat. And this is uh, indeed signs for those people who reflect. So in one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarizes this. <coughs> The, the life of marriage from the beginning to middle to the, to end. the end. Absolutely, that tells very eloquently. Of course, Quran is the most eloquent voice to tell exactly what we were alluding to earlier, which is that um, you may not feel totally head over heels enthralled with this individual when you marry. And you may find lots of struggle in, as you're trying to meld your personalities and meld your cultures and meld your lifestyles and habits. You might have all these things, oh, why did I do this? It's so much work. But you know what? If you found somebody that you really respect how they are as a human being, and they're kind to you and you're kind to them, that love and commitment grows and grows and grows and grows. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I love my husband 20 times as much now as I did three years ago because I've had more experience with him and more interaction with him. We didn't have before we were married, but as married couple committed to, we were ready. We said, yes, we'd like to do this thing, which is marriage and work really hard at it. And we'd both seen what it's like wrong. And now we've both seen what it's like right. And alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, it's a great, great thing to find your soulmate. I think on that positive note, I know that it's time for you to, to be going to other sessions, and I don't want to delay you, but I'll stay for a while in case anybody was shy to ask a question and would like to come up. Jazakum khair for letting me be here today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.